it because he was so cross. The tailor felt so ill that he had to go to bed. It was Christmas time, and all the rats of Gloucester were having a party in the tailor's shop. I'm afraid, Miss Potter, we must ask you to omit this illustration. Whatever for? Well, uh, the rats could well have been... Uh, yes? Drinking. But surely that's not going to turn the children who see it into drunkards. Well, no, but uh, Sunday schools, the temperance movement is very strong. We wouldn't want to offend. It might offend Miss Potter, and we wouldn't want that. I knew you'd force me to cut it out. We're not forcing you to do anything, Miss Potter. We think it's in the best interest of your own delightful story. The mice were so sorry for the tailor that they decided to help him. And that night from the tailor's shop came a glow of light. And when Simpkin crept up to peep in the window, it was full of candles. There was a snippeting of scissors and a snappeting of thread and little mouse voices singing, three little mice sat down to spin. Pussy passed by and she peeped in. What are you at, my fine little men? Making coats for gentlemen? Shall I come in and cut off your threads? Oh, no, Miss Pussy, you'd bite off our heads. And they clicked their thimbles to mark out the time. But then their voices became very angry, and he could hear them shouting in little twittering voices, No more twist! Simkin went away, very ashamed at his badness compared with those good little mice. When the tailor awoke in the morning, the first thing he saw was a skein of cherry-coloured twisted silk. And beside his bed stood the repentant Simkin. And imagine the tailor's delight and amazement when he went back to his shop in despair to see the waistcoat almost finished. Everything was finished except one cherry-coloured buttonhole. And where that buttonhole was wanting, there was pinned a scrap of paper with these words in teeny no more twist. And from then began the luck of the tailor of Gloucester. He grew quite stout and he grew quite rich. It is got up in the choicest style and illustrated with 26 of the finest pictures it is possible to imagine. Oh, congratulations. I'm sure that's the first time a children's book has been so well reviewed in the tailor and cutter. <laughs> and Peter Rabbit. Translated into French. That's a triumph too, don't you think? I think one day he'll go all over the world. Pierre Lapin. I don't like Pierre Lapin, actually. Oh? No, I would prefer Pierre Lapereau. Oh, I don't know the word. Oh, it means baby rabbit. Oh. And quite honestly, I think the lady who did the translation, Mademoiselle Victorine Ballon, could have done better with Flopsy, Mopsy and Cottontail. What about Flopso? Trotso and Queue de Coton. <laughs> it's enchanting. You're very well up on your French, Mademoiselle Potter. Well, I had a lot of time with nothing much else to do but study. I think you're rather like a Laporeau yourself. Uh, come in. Uh, Alfred, uh, yes, just put them on the table there. Thank you. I like the drawings of this new rabbit, Benjamin. Perhaps it's a bit early for another rabbit book so soon after Peter. I have an idea for a squirrel story. Well, the rabbits seem very popular. We're reprinting Peter for the fifth time. Well, perhaps I ought to leave the squirrel story till after my holidays in the Lake District. I wish I could come with you. Perhaps you will one day. What about this little hedgehog? Ah, oh, well, now, that's my Mrs. Tiggywinkle. She really deserves a book of her own. Well, I mean, why not? To put a little bonnet on her head and a, a little apron, she'd look exactly like a, an old washerwoman. Yes. <laughs> and those crinkly little hands. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Just behave. Hmm? Bit me. <laughs> Poor thing, she's probably getting bored with posing. The Warns have asked me to a party. 
I hope you're going. I don't think Mother would approve. Well, don't tell her then. Don't let Mother bully you. If you tried it with me, I wouldn't have it. Why don't you come and stay with me for a bit? Hmm? Remember what fun we had up in Scotland when we were young? Actually, I modelled Mrs. Tiggywinkle on that old washerwoman we used to have. Oh, Mrs. Mackintosh. Yes. <laughs> yeah. so I got a mangle. If, if I don't feel like farming, I, I go painting. It's a fine life. Come and stay with me for a bit. Oh, it's so much easier if you're a man. You're so... You're so soft. Be a real Crompton for once. girls get presents. Have you been a good little girl? Yes. At least I think so. Ah. What's your name? Winifred. Winifred. Has Winifred been a good little girl? No! Yes, she has been a good little girl, oh, Father good. Come on, children. Let's see what's under the tree. Oh. Here. Oh, then. What have we have got? got a nice big Christmas tree at home after me? No, I'm afraid we don't have one at all. Well, you see, my parents are rather old. And they don't really hold with Christmas. How sad. And one for Miss Beatrix Popper. Oh, thank you, Father Christmas. It's a pleasure. <laughs> it's Uncle Johnny Crow! Oh, no, it isn't. No, it's Father Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> Look what Uncle Johnny Crow has made for me. What is it? It's a mouse house. <laughs> Thank you, Norman. It's just what I wanted. <laughs> I've got a bigger house than that. Have you? Come and look. It's meant to be a surprise. Oh, dear. <sighs> oh, what a oh, lovely oh, house. Oh, Silly old Uncle Johnny Crow hasn't quite finished it yet. Well, there's gratitude for you. <laughs> Who'd be an uncle? <laughs> it's going to have real muslin curtains and blinds. And who's going to live in it? Oh. A lady called Lucinda. And and Jane the cook. Lucky Lucinda. Auntie Bee, mm -hmm. could you make a book about them for me? Oh, Auntie Bee's too busy. Well, it's not a bad idea, though, is it? We could do it together, if we had Lucinda and Jane. And your mice. Naughty mice. Mice are naughty. Bad mice, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> Gollywogs are very popular with the young folk this year, sir. Oh, yes. This doll. Look. She closes her eyes when she lies down. Hmm. I was, um, looking for a young lady called Lucinda. Uh, Lucinda? Yes, Lucinda. A respectable young lady. Oh. <laughs> what about this one, sir? Oh. Yes, she will do nicely. And then I need a cook called Jane. Yes, sir. <laughs> a cook called Jane. Ah! Oh. What about her, sir? Oh, a lovely cook with good references. 
Uh, yes, Jane will suit the situation perfectly. Thank you. I told you, Mother, I was going to a party weeks ago. You didn't say it was with the Warns. They're charming people and very kind. They are not people of our station, Beatrix. They're in trade. Your father and I forbid you to mix with them socially in the future. I don't see how printing books is any more degrading than printing calico like grandfather. Don't be impertinent, Beatrix. Apologize to your mother. So sorry, Mother. I shouldn't have said that. This hobby of yours is all very well in its own place, but the trouble with you is you will overdo things. You're quite exhausted. This gallivanting around. You know you're not strong. You need a rest. If you strain your eyes, it'll be nobody's fault but your own. And you've been quite neglecting the house here. Cook tells me she's been left to choose the meals. Christmas luncheon was inedible. It's not very grateful of you, Beatrix, after all we've done for you. No, Mother. I'm so sorry about the food. But I don't see how I can manage without going to the publishers from time to time. Letters. Business is always better done by letter, especially with printers and publishers. Then you have a record in case of trouble. Yes, Papa. And I regret I cannot call at the office. I have had such painful unpleasantness at home about our books. I should be obliged if you would kindly say no more about the new book at present. Bedford Square now and do some sketches of the doll's house. Oh, but it isn't there anymore. I finished it and it's in my brother's house in Surbiton, in Winifred's nursery. Oh, I don't think I could get to Surbiton without having to stay for lunch. But my sister-in-law would be most pleased if you would. My mother would never allow it. She is also most welcome. It sounds so uncivil and rude. My mother is so difficult and exacting. It's very, very vexing. I don't know what to do. I understand, Bee. How could you? I do. Look, would it help you if I took some photographs of it for you? Yes, I think I could manage that. Do you think you could take the photographs from the left side of the house? I, 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 I will take it from all angles, really. So Norman took the photographs, and Beatrix used them as the backgrounds for her new book, the tale of two bad mice. And it was a beautiful doll's house, and it had real muslin curtains and blinds, and it belonged to two dolls called Lucinda and Jane. Lucinda and Jane have gone out for a drive in the doll's perambulator. Tom Thumb and Hunker Munker decide to explore the house. For you, Miss Beatrix, it's, um, it's from Handley's. Oh, thank you, Cox. Aren't you going to open it, Beatrix? Yes, certainly, Mama. Thumb and Hunker Munker went upstairs and peeped into the dining room. Then they squeaked with joy. Such a lovely dinner was laid out upon the table. But the mice found the food was hard as hard. The ham was as hard as the hams of the cheesemongers. And the fish was glued to the plate. Then Tom Thumb lost his temper. 
there was no end to the rage and disappointment of those mice. So they set to work to do all the mischief they could. They even took the bolster from the doll's bed. A bookcase and a birdcage and the cradle and several odds and ends. What a sight met the eyes of Jane and Lucinda when they returned. Hunker Munker got the cradle and some useful pots and pans. My dear Norman, I need a policeman. So that is the story of the two bad mice. But they weren't so very, very naughty after all, because Tom Thumb paid for everything he broke. He found a crooked sixpence under the hearth rug, and upon Christmas Eve, he and Hunker Munker stuffed it into one of the stockings of Lucinda and Jane. And very early, every morning, before anybody is awake, Hunker Munker comes with her dustpan and her broom and sweeps the dolly's house. There you are. And I put your name in the front. Can I see? Thank you so much, Auntie Bee. Can I have my dolls back now, please? <laughs> yes, here you are. What a clever mouse you are, Hunker. She was such a clever, brave little mouse, it was all my fault teaching her to do those tricks. Of course it wasn't. She loved to play, all mice loved to play. Naughty mice. Mice are naughty. <laughs> Look, our little book will be her memorial. Yes. I wish we had another book planned out before the summer. I feel so empty when they're finished. And I wish I didn't have to go away for such a long time. Yes, so do I. Well, perhaps one day. I, um... I got you this, um, so you won't forget me. Oh, Norman. Thank you. It's quite funny. I got you this. So you wouldn't forget me. Miss Beatrix, a letter for you from London. I thought you'd like me to bring it. Thank you, Cox. I love and respect you more than anyone in the world. Will you do me the honor of allowing me to take your hand in marriage? Well, I will. Norma, my dearest, my dearest dear. My own true love.
Norman would laugh. There. I can talk to you about him. But I can't talk to them. It's utterly stupid and ridiculous. They know. Of course they know. Why do they think I'm wearing this ring? I'm going to tell them. I'm going to tell them here and now that I love Norman and I'm going to marry him. Mama, a message came for you, Beatrix. By the telegraph. I'm afraid one of the Mr. Warns has died. Which Mr. Warren? Norman, I think it said the name was. Still. There are several brothers, your father tells me, so it shouldn't affect your little books. We are very sorry, dear, but please move out of the horse's way. never admit he was ill. He hated making a fuss. When the doctor came, he diagnosed leukemia, and it was too late, though we didn't know it. He forbade us all to even let you know, in case it worried you. The end was sudden and quite unexpected, but very peaceful. His last words were of his love and respect for you. quite a small farm but we <coughs> live in London yes I know but I could easily employ a hind well that's what they call a man who would manage the farm for me have you spoken to your father about this farm my dear yes my dear I've considered it nobody told me well we wanted to look into it I wanted to discuss it with Bertram I think um, it seems a very sound investment what does Bertram know about investment? Well, after all, he is a farmer. Well, I've had quite a lot of experience at uh, this sort of farming. The land's very similar, and I, uh, I managed to make a reasonable living from it. I am well aware that Bertram has chosen farming as a profession, if that's the right word for it. But he is a man, and you are a woman. Quite a lot of women farm in Scotland. And it's Bee's money, which she's earned herself, isn't it? Why shouldn't she spend it as she pleases? Well, yes, Bertram. It really isn't your business. You realise there's no question of your living on this farm by yourself? Of course not, Mother. I should continue to live at home and help you manage the house. Very well. As long as it's considered purely as an investment. farmer you have to expect it good lambing this year fair to middling some nice gimmers there ah. and the old ram did well at the estelle show it did didn't he 
He's getting broken mouth, though. He'll not hear the cuckoo again. Do you think I should buy the sheep as well, Mr. Hewlett? You don't have to, Miss Potter. They go with the farm. Oh. Morning, Harry. These Herdwick sheep are heft to the hill. They were born here on this farm, and if you took them anywhere in the district, they'd come back. Strong homing instinct. Like cats. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Will you be buying the cattle now? Well, if I don't, what will happen to them? Oh, they go to market. Most do. Yes, of course. What about you and your family? Oh, there's a hiring fair at Keswick, back end. Would you like to stay and look after the farm for me? Yes, ma'am, I would indeed. You see, I shan't be living here. I shall just be visiting whenever I can. I'd like to keep the old cottage for myself, but we could build on a new part for you and your family. Do you think that would be all right, Mr. Helis? I think it's altogether an admirable idea. Good. Beatrix Potter moved into Hilltop Farm in the summer of 1906, shortly after her 40th birthday. Will you put it over there, please? On top of the dress there. Those look nice, Mrs. Cannon. Mm. Real nice and cosy. Oh, it's them rats. The place is plagued with them. I'll have to reline that drawer. Perhaps they needed the wallpaper to paper their nests. Well, they're a proper nuisance. Mr. Cannon's having all the doors lined with zinc, and I'm keeping all the cat's kittens, all three of them. They must have lived here for centuries. These thick walls and secret staircases. <laughs> and they're that cheeky. I saw one the other day, eating his supper as bold as daylight under this very table. And my flower, mind you. <laughs> Mrs. Cannon, might I borrow one of your kittens as a model? We can have our Tom with pleasure. He's a proper little pickle. You're a proper pickle, Tom. And Mrs. Cannon says your sisters are just as bad. No wonder your mother loses you all the time and has to lock you in the cupboard on baking days. Now, this story is really about you and Mr. Samuel Whiskers and his wife, Anna Maria. Now, they were both rats. And they were also very busy on baking day, stealing pats of butter and flour and even your mother's rolling pin. Now, this day, you decided to climb up the chimney. This very chimney. Look. Of course, you got covered in soot as you climbed up and up. You waded through miles of soot till you were like a little chimney sweep. You got very frightened, especially when you found some mutton bones lying about and a funny smell, something like mouse, only dreadfully strong. You squeezed through a hole in the wall and all at once you fell down a hole and landed on a heap of very dirty rags. Opposite to you, as far away as he could sit, was an enormous rat. Please, sir, the chimney wants sweeping, you squeaked. Then an old woman rat poked her head round the rafter, and before you knew what was happening, they tied you up into a bundle with string in very hard knots. Samuel Whiskers rushed to get the rolling pin, and pretty soon they were rolling you into a kitten roly-poly pudding. Roly-poly, roly-poly. Roly. Suddenly, there were sounds up above. The noise of a little dog scratching and yelping. <gasps> we are discovered and interrupted, Anna Maria. Let us collect our property and other people's and depart at once. I fear we shall be obliged to leave this pudding. It would have been a very sooty dumpling. So the rats ran away down the street, taking the mutton bones and half a smoked ham in a stolen wheelbarrow. 
twin sisters, Moppet and Mittens, have grown into very good rat catchers. They hang up rats' tails in a row on the barn door to show how many they've caught. Dozens and dozens of them. But Tom Kitten has always been afraid of a rat. He never durst face anything that is bigger than a mouse. And I hope that won't really come true, Tom. Oh, no. Look, Dad, she's done it again. Let her clutching the rhubarb this time. Well, you, you best tell your mother. That duck never stays on her eggs, so the missy sticks him under her hen. Now the silly creature tries to hide him every time she lays. Poor thing. I suppose it's only natural. She's such a daft duck, she'd lay him in a fox's earth if she had half a chance. <laughs> <laughs> the unlucky bird became Jemima Puddle Duck, who tried to hide her eggs, but they were always found and carried off. She became quite desperate and determined to make a nest right away from the farm. She set off on a fine spring morning along the cart track that leads over the hill. She was wearing a shawl and a poke bonnet. When she reached the top of the hill, she saw a wood in the distance. She ran downhill, flapping her shawl and jumped off into the air. An elegantly dressed gentleman was sitting amongst the foxgloves reading a newspaper. And he looked curiously at Jemima. You lost your way, he said. Jemima explained that she was trying to find a convenient nesting place. That's no difficulty. I have a sack full of feathers in my woodshed, said the bushy, long-tailed gentleman. It was indeed very comfortable, and Jemima made a nest without any trouble at all. Jemima Puddle Duck laid nine eggs, and she told the gentleman that she would go to the farm and bring back some corn so that she need never leave her nest until the eggs were hatched. May I ask you to bring some herbs from the garden to make a savoury omelette? And perhaps two onions, said the hospitable gentleman with sandy whiskers. The collie dog, Kep, was very interested to hear Jemima's story. Father? He went out around the village looking for two foxhound puppies who were out for a walk with the butcher. Jemima went back to her nest in the polite gentleman's woodshed. Suddenly there came the most awful noises, barking, baying, growls and howls, and nothing more was ever seen of that foxy-whiskered gentleman. Unfortunately, the puppies dashed in and gobbled up her eggs. She laid some more in June, but only four of them hatched. Jemima Puddle Duck said it was because of her nerves. She had always been a bad sitter. The shop window was full of them. And some of that squirrel, um... Nutkin. Mm. Mm. It'll be mice next, I suppose. Well, are you getting a royalty? Of course I'm not. Pure piracy, just the same as the American books. Well, you really ought to speak to Warns about it. Well, I have done, but their business is publishing books, not making toys. Horrible, isn't it? Made in Germany? Well, if you want something done in this life, you've got to do it yourself. Yes. What did you say you call him, Miss Peter? Uh... Peter Rabbit. Peter Rabbit, of course, yes. Very nice. Uh, I, uh, I haven't read your books, not being the right age, you might say. <laughs> Begging your pardon, miss. Well, the Germans have, and they're making a good deal of money out of them. Yes, well, I'm sure they are, the cheap way they turn them out. Well, why can't you do the same? Oh, it's the quality, miss. You see, take this doll of yours. I mean, that's, that's a nice doll, really nice. I'd love to make it, but, well, they wouldn't be no good. Why not? Too expensive. Oh, it didn't last longer. It's a better toy, but... Well, the truth is, people buy what's cheap. See, the whole of our Camberwell toy industry is nearly dead. Killed by cheap foreign competition. There's my factory, miss. Just empty shelves. You see, we make quality goods. That's what's killing us. 
Ten years ago, my warehouse was full. Ooh, I was moving 70 gross of teddy bears at Christmas. Now, well, it's just pitiful. But won't the government protect you? Whew. Not this government, anyway. And that's why we say, vote for tariff reform. Why? Because the shops are full of cheap common trash from abroad. And people are so stupid. Oh, they buy the rubbish oh. because they... Oh, we're stupid, are we? Well, what stupid. really is happening is that they're making the storekeepers rich and putting our workmen out of work. Hey, what about our cheap bread, eh? Hey? Yeah, what about it? What's the point of cheap bread if you haven't any wages? We're not living in the days of the it's corn. It's all right for the likes of you to talk. You'll get your cheap bread all right. Work, isn't it? And you'll save the Camberwell dolly into the bargain if you vote Conservative. Vote for Chamberlain and Bonner Law. Vote for tariff reform. <laughs> Of course they won't. They'll all vote liberal. Men are so pig-headed. Seven, eight, nine, three, four. What a clever little dog you are, Duchess. You do beg beautifully. Sweetly pretty, I'm going to enjoy drawing you. Oh, are you going to put Duchess in a story, miss? Yes. In fact, it's all about how Duchess is invited out to tea by a cat called Ribby, who also lives in the village. Well, who's the story for then, please, miss? Well, it's really for you. For all the children of Sorry. Will you put our house in it, please, miss? Well, I will. If your mother will allow it. Nice. Very nice, Beatrix. And this new format is sure to sell well. Well, I hope you're right. Um, as to your new story, the, uh, the tale of Mr. Todd. Huh? Strange name, is it not? Well, surely a very common name for a fox. Especially in Scotland. Saxon, I think. Hey, quote the Todd, it's a broad brick nicked. Surely you must have heard that before. Um, we, uh, we feel that the opening paragraph is not very, uh, very good taste. Huh? I am quite tired of making goody-goody books about nice people. I will make a story about two disagreeable people called Tommy Brock and Mr. Todd. There are also some rather uh, disagreeable references in the book. Uh, bull banks. Uh, uh, there were many unpleasant things lying about that had much better have been buried. In short, we feel the morality of the book's theme might offend the public. My dear Harold, if it's not impertinent to lecture one's own publisher, I think you worry too much about the public. I don't give a tuppenny button what they think. I want to please my readers, children. I always make paste-up copies of the book first for them to read. They know what's good and what's bad, and they like Mr. Todd and Tommy Brock. Nothing they like better than a couple of good villains. I would prefer that nothing were changed. Not a word. She won't make good bacon. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Ah, Mr. Healis. Mr. Cannon doesn't think I should buy this sow. What do you think? Charming little pig. Yes, that's what I think. Fox, oh, you're too short on the leg. Mr. Healis agrees with me. We'll buy her. Yes, yes. Charming little pig. She's got an interesting expression. I'm glad I bumped into you this morning, Miss Potter. There's a farm coming up for sale in Sorry. Castle Cottage. March is with you. Next door to Hilltop. Are you interested? Yes, very. I could take you round one day, if you like. I'd like that very much. Good. Mm -hmm. 
spring up there on the hill I've never known fail. You could pipe the water down to a reservoir tank near the house. And you really think I ought to buy it, Mr. Healers? I wasn't very sure about that black sow. <laughs> <laughs> but I am about this farm. I really think you should buy it, Miss Potter. Why? Because it's a good buy. Not entirely. I just think you would look after it better than most people. And does that matter so much to you? I mean, being the agent. Yes, it matters to me very much. Very much indeed. This is my country and I can't bear to see it spoiled. You can throw her up as a bungalows and build us a tea shacks and widen us a bridges. Good Lord, deliver us, as an old friend of mine, Canon Rawnsley, used to say. <laughs> really you, William. You should be a tall, thin animal. Helis. I remember the name. Country solicitors and agents. A very ordinary little man. A very charming gentleman. And we have many interests in common. But you can't possibly marry a man like that. I'm sorry to be a disappointment to you, Mother. I know you would have much preferred me to marry a lord. Or at least a Manchester cotton millionaire's son. But they have not asked me. Mr. Healis has, and I have accepted him. Rupert. Uh, I think you should write to Mr. Healis, Beatrix, explaining our attitude and regretting that after some consideration you have decided to change your mind. I think that's damned unfair, Father. Why shouldn't Bee choose who she likes? She's 47. She has got her own money. But should be silent. You know nothing at all about marriage. Oh, don't I? I've been married myself for the last nine years, very happily married, to an innkeeper's daughter from the village. You married to an innkeeper's daughter? Why in heaven haven't you told us? You wouldn't have approved. And I didn't want to have to put up with the sort of rowing poor bees having with you. I'll speak to you later. Thanks for being such a trump. I'm afraid we've got to be frank about it. Mother's a spoilt, selfish old woman. The real reason why she doesn't want you to get married is because you won't be able to go on being her unpaid housekeeper anymore. Oh, poor Mother, I do no, feel... No, B. Not poor Mother, poor B. You are going to marry him, aren't you? Whatever happens. Yes. Promise? You're just into the picture. Thank you. Come on, B. Yes. Hold his hand or something. Try that. <laughs> right, we're almost ready. Ready? Now, 
Beatrix Potter and William Helis were married in London on October the 14th, 1913. They were to spend their married life at Castle Hill Cottage, Sorry. But Beatrix always kept Hilltop Farm as her own private sanctuary. This crow story is a very charming idea, but uh, we do find the writing rather disappointing. It's more like Aesop than Beatrix Potter. Uh, did you manage to sketch out your ideas for the illustrations? No, I have not. I haven't had time. I'm a farmer. And with all the young men off at this wretched war, I'm having to do a lot of the heavy work myself. And lambs take precedence over books. Well, we were just hoping. Oh, I'm sure you were. So was I. My little books have kept us all very nicely for I don't know how many years. Ten at least. Well, the truth is, I'm written out for books. And my eyes are tired for painting. Well, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but you would have had to have faced it sooner or later. Well, I can't continue with these damn little books when I'm dead and buried. Look, I would be very grateful that if in future you would give instructions to your staff that under no circumstances are my whereabouts to be disclosed to anyone whosoever. Well, of course, your, your instructions will be strictly adhered to. Hello, dear uh, Millie, how nice to see you. Uh, Harold told me you were coming today, of course. You look well. Well, life at Sorry agrees with her, doesn't it, Harold? <laughs> Harold, have you? Uh, oh, um, uh, Beatrix, dear Beatrix, uh, I think you know that we, all of us, think of you as one of the family, uh, especially since Norman died. We would so much like to wish you every happiness with your marriage. Yes, indeed. Thank you. To tell you the truth, I have been feeling a little uncomfortable with you all lately. Especially when you ask me about Sori. You'd only be human not to feel a little hurt. Norman was a saint. If ever man was good. But I'm sure he would not object. He would be pleased if you're happy. I am. I'm very much attached to William. In fact, I feel as if I've been married to him for years. With our best wishes. Oh, what a weighty gift. <laughs> Mrs. Bean. <laughs> she will be our first and most welcome guest. <laughs> Mrs. Helis of Sorry was no longer the Beatrix Potter of the old days. Her happiness and inspiration was now in her farming and her men. But all her life, Beatrix continued to love children and animals. The little person made a bob curtsy. Oh, yes, if you please, ma'am. My name is Mrs. Tiggywinkle. Oh, yes, if you please, ma'am. I'm an excellent clear starcher. And she took something out of a clothes basket and spread it on the ironing blanket. As a new generation discovered with delight her books, she became almost snowed under with letters all of which she answered herself. These were forwarded to her by her publishers. It may seem surprising in view of her increasing dislike of visitors that when an American lady penetrated Mrs. Helis's defences in the early 20s, she was met with such enthusiasm. You cannot imagine what a difference it made when your little books came into my department of the New York Public Library. Children who'd never even read before just burst into reading as they turned the pages. 
We have a lot of immigrants who can't speak English. And I know that your beautiful little animal books have actually been the best education we could give them. Well, when an artist like yourself, Mrs. Helis, can, can give a really true and a moving impression of her own country, well then, well, there are no barriers in the world when it comes to the enjoyment of picture books. I've never actually been abroad, Miss Moore. But I'm so very pleased to hear it. Would you like to stay here a while? I'm sure we can find you a toothbrush and a nightie. Oh, I would. Oh, I really would. So would Nicholas Knickerbocker. Wouldn't we, Nicholas? Yes, we would. Now take the key and run on down the lane to Hilltop. Unlock the door and rummage to your heart's content. And you'll be able to tell the children in America that you've seen every nook and corner of Tom Kitten's house. You'll not be disturbed by any of Samuel Whisker's relations. Enjoy yourself. You always seem to be able to understand what a child wants. It was probably the way I was brought up. Part of me stayed in my childhood until I was quite old. Until I got married, actually. And then you stopped writing. Oh, I'm no good at working to order. When I had nothing else to say, I had the sense to stop. In the land of green ginger, there is a town called Marmalade, which is inhabited exclusively by guinea pigs. <laughs> that was never published. <laughs> but it's charming. Mrs. Heaves, you wouldn't write just one more book, would you? As a favor to all those American children who love your work so much. You Americans are a perfidiously complimentary nation, Miss Moore. Well, I suppose I have a lot of bits and pieces left over. But I don't know how I'd ever manage the drawings. Maybe a little longer story, with just a few black and white illustrations. So the fairy caravan was born. Beatrix Potter invented a caravan circus, which traveled around the country near Sori, but was invisible to human beings. It was a bigger and longer book than any before. the true picture of England in this wonderful book. And children will love it. I was afraid it was a lot of bosh. This isn't bosh. This is magic. I hope you understand why I don't want it published in Britain. It's too personal. Too autobiographical. Yes, of course. I quite understand, Beatrix. To Warns, her faithful English publishers, Beatrix admitted that the fairy caravan didn't stand up to comparison with her early work. But children everywhere did love the fairy caravan and still do to this day. After that, Mrs. Helis turned her whole attention to farming. How's your lambing going, Tom? Medium fair, Mrs. Helis. That late snow didn't do no one no good. Well, at tuppence a pound, I don't see much future for these herdwicks. Aye. But they're the only sheep for these fells. Maybe. They've opened a new line or factory in Lancaster. No one wants our druggage anymore for carpet. <laughs> but the poor sheep still have to be shorn. No one wants our wool, though. What about this, then? Made from my own wool. Warm and hard. 
will last me out my lifetime, so don't be such an old pessimist, Tom Benson. We're sure it will make a delightful story, Beatrix. Mm -hmm. The only query is the colour of the frog. I mean, aren't frogs usually greener? Meet Mr. Jeremy Fisher. <laughs> Grand piano by error. Oh. Ah, Mr. Hanson. Good morning, Mrs. Helis. I was sorry to hear about your mother. Well, it was all very peaceful. And she was very old. Still, it's a link that's gone with the old times. Leisurely times. Stately carriage horses. No horrible motors. The Keswick coach. You first came to Sorry on that coach. I don't suppose you even remember it, do you, Mr. Hanson? Of course I do. Well, just. If this land fell into the hands of the developers, think what a ruination it would be. I agree with you, Mrs. Healis. But it's a lot of money to raise by subscription. Courage, Mr. Hanson. We've got to have courage at this game. I can't afford it, but I'll buy it, and I'll sell half to the National Trust when you can raise the money. The other half I'll keep for my lifetime. That's most generous, ma'am. Generous? What would old Canon Rawnsley have thought of us if we'd let this one slip? Mother's money will come in useful sooner than we thought. So clever of you to buy Tilberthwaite. And at such a good price. Did you notice it once belonged to your great-grandfather? Which? Abraham Crompton. Old Grandmama would have been so pleased. I put in a clause about the future tenancy when, uh, you know, when... When we're dead and buried. Yes. Then the trust takes full control. I thought you would like to be sure that it was let to a suitable local farmer. Not an off-comer like me. <laughs> and at a reasonable rent? Yes, of course, that's what I wish. What you wish, too. What we wish. I'm so lucky to have you with it. I think it's rather the other way round. Oh, no. Without you, I wouldn't have had any of this. This happy life. And the farming. I couldn't have done it without you. Well, good. <laughs> Of all her many purchases, Troutbeck Park Farm, one of the finest sheep farms in the Lake District, became Mrs. Helis's favorite property, and she managed it herself. She loved to wander on the Troutbeck Fell. Sometimes she had with her an old sheepdog, nip or fly. More often, she went alone, but never lonely. There was the company of gentle sheep and wildflowers and singing waters. As the years went by, this crusty, endearing, yet formidable old lady grew more and more to look like Mrs. Tiggy. Grandmother, for folks like me and me, 
Ah, and no mistake. Would you like your machine? No, Tom. Here, look. Have one on my head. Thanks very much, though. Thanks. As to Beatrix Potter, although the little books were selling better than ever, no one in the outside world really knew who she was anymore, or if she was alive or dead, which was exactly as she wished it. The Second World War saw Mrs. Healis still hard at work on the land for the war effort, but in the winter of 1943, she was laid low with bronchitis. Joe Mosscrop about the lambing at Troutbeck. Shake his hand for me. And don't forget to put down the crumbs for the mice. Beatrix Potter died on the 23rd of December, 1943, aged 77. She died as she had lived, as simply as possible, without fuss or regret. In her will, Beatrix Potter left all the land she had purchased to the National Trust. Thousands of acres of valuable countryside preserved from development. Seventeen farms, her legacy to the people of Britain. Low Udall, Tilberthwaite, High Udall, Penny Hill, Busk Langdale, Dale End, High Park, Low Oxenfell, High Oxenfell, Hill Top. But Beatrix Potter's legacy to the world was her books and those little animals that will remain in the hearts of the children of all nations for all time.